You've probably heard a lot about the capital asset pricing model. Using live data from two stocks, I'd like to illustrate the actual capital asset pricing model, how we get the beta that goes into capital asset pricing model, and importantly, how we interpret the capital asset pricing model. In order to illustrate the capital asset pricing model, I took two stocks that I own, CVS and Applied Materials, and I calculated monthly excess returns going back four years. That's an arbitrary choice. By monthly, I could have used weekly or daily returns. By excess, that means in excess of the risk-free rate, so I subtracted a risk-free assumption. And my four years is also arbitrary. Nothing magic about that. When we look on financial portals, we'll sometimes see a three-year beta or a five-year beta, for example. And we just want enough data in the sample to have a meaningful, meaningfully sized sample. But the longer that window, the further back in time we're going. And in theory, the more distant those data points are, the less relevant they may be. So there's a trade-off there between sample size and relevance. So I've got four years of monthly excess returns for CVS and applied materials. I also need a proxy for the overall market. And I'm really going to emphasize proxy here as in rough approximation because I chose the S&P 500 index, which is familiar, but also just very easy for me to get those numbers. And I know that in doing that, it's not the overall market. For one thing, the S&P 500 is just large capitalization stocks. So we want to be mindful of this fact that to get the betas that we're going to use in CAPM, we're really regressing in some sample, and there's, those samples will change over time and be different based on our assumptions. So there's imperf imperfection in the sample selection, but also generally in terms of what we call the market portfolio. Here I'm using a market index as a proxy for the market portfolio. So having done that then, I'm going to do, or I did, a univariate regression in order to estimate each of these stocks beta, because that this is all about here, getting the beta. For CVS, it's 0.82. For applied materials, the beta that I got was 1.8. So here on the left for CVS, I have a univariate regression of the excess returns for CVS on the y-axis against regressing here the dependent against the independent, which is the market's excess returns. So I have a scatter plot of 48 monthly returns and then a best fit line where I've got a slope coefficient here that's going to be my beta. My slope coefficient for CVS is less than 1 of its 0.82. For applied materials, the reason I picked this stock is that I was expecting it to have a beta of greater than 1, and its beta is even higher than I expected. It's 1.8. Now, how can we interpret these betas? Well, there's two things. One, just visually in terms of the scatter plot, if we're thinking about what's the riskier stock, the riskier stock is the one that has more negative outcomes with more with greater magnitude. And visually in the scatter plot, that is applied materials. It has more negative outcomes and their magnitude is generally greater. So applied materials, just strictly speaking, looks like the riskier stock. But I also want to focus on risk when I interpret the beta which is to say, how do we interpret a slope coefficient in a regression? Well, the 1.8 is the expected change in the dependent for a one unit change in the independent. And we want to focus here on bad times, which is to say a negative shock in the market's returns. So let's say that's negative 100 basis points. That's about like this. That's, our, that's what we'll call bad times. Or, if the market return changes by negative 100 basis points, negative 1%, the 1.8 slope here means that we expect applied materials, its return to drop by 1.8 times that, or 180 basis points. So this higher beta makes it a riskier stock than CVS, where CVS, when there's a 100 basis point shock to the market, C 
CVS has an expected drop of only 82 basis points. It's lower beta means lower expected drop when there's bad times in the market. And really, so as we switch over to capital asset pricing model as an instance of factor theory, it's really that interpretation that I'd prefer to think about because what we're saying is that applied materials will have a higher expected return in the capital asset pricing model. Why? Because that's what we demand, this higher expected return. That's the compensation for the fact that it's higher beta means that it's going to drop more when there's a bad time in the market or when there's a negative shock to the market return. See how that is? CVS, we don't expect it to drop as much, so we demand less compensation for that reduced risk. So before I flip over to the um, capital asset pricing model implementation for each of these stocks, just a quick note about its relationship to correlation because this is oftentimes confused. And so here, the capital asset pricing model that we're going to look at is right here. Expected return of either of my securities is going to be equal to the risk-free rate plus here this product. So that means I could also, my graphs are in terms of ex excess return. So of course, I can subtract the risk-free rate off each side. And then I can just say the expected excess return is just a product of here the uh, quantity of risk, beta, and the price of risk, the expected excess return on the market or the market's risk premium. And what I just wanted to show here quickly was that is that beta is equal to covariance divided by variance. Covariance, any covariance itself is the product of rho, the correlation rho between the security and market and the volatilities. So covariance here is equal to rho times volatility of the security times volatility of the market. That is the numerator, the covariance numerator here. And the variance denominator, of course, is the standard deviation squared. So that means immediately here from this beta, we can cancel from the numerator and denominator one volatility of the market and we end up here with an equivalent expression for beta which is correlation multiplied by cross volatility where we want the securities standard deviation the numerator and the markets standard deviation or volatility in the denominator so you can see beta we can think of beta as correlation scaled by cross volatility but it's not the same thing as correlation. It's certainly not the same thing as volatility, which I have sometimes read mistakenly. We want to be specific about what we mean by beta. So just to take that relationship, just for example, in terms of my two stocks with real numbers here, you can see for applied materials, my uh, regression-based slope coefficient, its beta is about 1.8. And it happens to be the case, and these are all real numbers based on the four-year sample, that that's based on a correlation between applied materials and my market proxy, the S&P 500, of 0.6. Pretty significant correlation, but also greatly driven by the cross-volatility and the fact that applied materials has a monthly volatility of 8.1%, so quite significant. That's driving a lot of this high beta. In the case of CVS, it's relatively low beta 0.8 is a product of its cor lower correlation of 0.46, although still a material correlation, and here a significantly lower cross volatility because the CVS monthly volatility is quite a bit lower. Okay. So given that, and given that we have retrieved the betas by doing a historical regression of excess return on against the market, then what I have here is the capital is their implementation into the capital asset pricing model. 
And what I've done immediately is go from the practice of the regression to the theory of the capital asset pricing model. So I started over with new assumptions here on risk-free rate and expected return of the market, 8%. But I am going to use the betas. I'm assuming that the historical betas we got, that we retrieved historically, are representative going forward. 0.8 for CVS and 1.8 for applied materials. And so then I have the capital asset pricing model as represented by the security market line here. And so the security market line gives us the expected return as a function of the securities beta. In the capital asset pricing model, my beta, beta is my x-axis and I have here the purple dot represents the market portfolio by definition with beta of 1 so its expected return is 8% per the assumption I gave and then we have here applied materials that, that's my high beta stock its expected return is the risk-free rate plus the beta of 1.8 multiplied by the market's risk premium or equity risk premium of 6% gives me 12.8%. So the capital market, the, the capital asset pricing model is telling me that for applied materials with a beta of 1.8, its expected return is 12.8%, much higher than CVS as compensation for the fact that its drop will, will be greater when there is a loss on the market return. And so you can see if I change the beta, for example, I'll change it to 1.7. Then I move down the security market line. And I could do the same thing for CVS. For low, lower beta corresponds to lower expected return. So then I would just make three summary points here about this security market line and the capital asset pricing model. And the first is that it's an ex-ante model. We did a regression ex post of historical data, and then we retrieved, the, we retrieved the betas into a model that's giving us an expected return going forward. So there is no alpha here, or if there is an alpha, it's not showing up because this is an ex ante model where the expected alpha is zero. The capital asset pricing model tells us that the expected return here of either of these stocks, you can see, is only a function of its systematic risk. Any idiosyncratic risk is going to be diversified away in the well-diversified portfolio. And the model does not expect um, non-zero alpha. So the model expects the security to be the return to be on the line as a function only of the security's beta exposure to the single common risk factor, its systematic risk. Secondly, as opposed to the capital market line that I looked at in the two previous videos, where in that capital market line, there were only efficient portfolios on the line with the security market line and capital asset pricing model, that's not the case. We can have any of these, many of these points will not be the most efficient. They will not be efficient. The security market line does not purport to contain efficient portfolios. It's only telling us the expected return is a function of the beta. Third and finally, then we, as we went from the practice of the regression to receive, to retrieve a beta from our sample, and then we plugged it into a theoretical model. There's a lot of theoretical assumptions that are a part of the capital asset pricing model that I didn't go over here. It only purports to be roughly true if there are, it's, well, really, it's about a dozen very stringent assumptions, including the absence of friction and taxes, that, that the um, investors can borrow and lend infinitely at the risk-free rate. And also two really stringent assumptions. It's the mean variance framework. Investors only care about standard deviation and mean. And then also the biggest one, I think, homogeneous expectations. All investors in the marketplace have identical views about the expected mean and variance of the assets. So a lot of stringent assumptions that, that 
inform really here the idea of the capital asset pricing model that the expected return of a security is really only a function of its beta exposure to the shared common factor that is the market's excess return. I hope that's helpful. Thank you.